I'm Deborah Davis, president and co-founder of the Women's History Project. Welcome to The Power of Indigenous Women's Voices. I want to begin today's session by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the traditional unceded lands of the Algonquin and Ashnabi nations. Let us know where you are in the chat. This very special event is our contribution to National Indigenous History Month as we lead up to National Indigenous Day and Jeanette's birthday on June 21st. It's our second event celebrating Indigenous women. The Women's History Project is a new national organization designed to profile the women trailblazers and leaders who contributed greatly to Canadian history. Our ambition is to advance women's equality by promoting the importance of their achievements, contributions, and the role women play. Today's session is our fifth since we launched in 2021. Thank you to our partners, the First People's House of Learning at Trent University and Don Laval Harvard in particular. I'd also like to thank CREA, the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement of Women, and Nancy's very own. Without their support, events like this could not happen. Before I introduce Dawn, our moderator for today's meeting, I'd like, to take, I'd like you to take a look at this trailer. Buffy St. Marie, Carry It On. The full documentary can be seen on Crave. This will be our first song. <clears throat> I'm cutting my own way through my own day, and all I dare say is it's my own. She was always way ahead of the game. She knew she had a gift, and she was not afraid to. Share it, show it, be proud of it. When she played, it was hers. The years I've known and the life I've grown got a way I'm going and it's my way. She's an icon, she's a six-time Juno winner, a trailblazer, an Academy Award winner, a companion to the Order of Canada. All of those things come to mind but they're not strong enough to actually define who Buffy St. Marie is. When you're told generation after generation that you're ugly, you're dirty, you're a savage, you don't belong, Buffy comes along, tells you something very different. She's such an amazing, well-rounded human being, and that comes through in everything that she does. Oh, I was very impressed with her. Her stage performance and her songwriting ability. Buffy was different. Buffy is the boldest woman I know in a quiet and compassionate way. Tears and it's my way. The places that Buffy has been erased from. Well, I mean, it's all of them, particularly the mainstream music industry. The years I've known and the life I'm grown. I'm so grateful for the work that Buffy has done to bring attention to missing and murdered Indigenous women and making sure that people are aware of what's going on so that we can do something about it. Throughout her career, she's always at the cutting edge, and her songs encapsulate all the time, drawing on the past, speaking now, and sending it into the future. You're bound for glory, all on your own one day. They only made one Buffy St. Marie, I can tell you. John Lavelle Harvard is a proud member of the WIC Wimakong First Nation. The first Aboriginal Trudeau scholar, Don has worked to advance the rights of Aboriginal women 
as the president of the Ontario Native Women's Association from 2003 to 2021. She has been the director of First Peoples House of Learning at Trent University since 2016, having left her previous role as president of the Native Women's Association of Canada in order to return to her grassroots as an educator. Dawn, over to you. Miigwech, Deborah. And miigwech, everybody, for joining us today. So I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be on screen with two of my heroes. Um, these women are literal rock stars that we all grew up admiring and, and to say that we would love to, to follow in your moccasins and walk in those footsteps would be a massive understatement. So when I said I was bringing these two women together, every young person in the, in the institution, in the university here was thrilled that everybody was coming together today. So I wanna take this opportunity to introduce Buffy St. Marie, an incredibly talented musician, poet, visual artist, a pathfinder, an activist, and a legend. Founder of the Nehalen Foundation and Cradle Board Teaching Project. And along with Buffy St. Marie for our fireside chat today and our conversation is Jeanette Corbier Laval, an educator, community worker, advocate, activist, you know, one of the first Indigenous women to challenge the government of Canada all the way to the Supreme Court and a founder of the Ontario Native Women's Association. So we're gonna to start today's session with a, a few questions just to get these ladies, our heroes up and, and having our conversation. So we wanna start with you, Buffy. What inspired you to become an activist, to use your voice and your music for social change, to make a difference? Oh, gosh, I, I certainly never envisioned myself doing any of the things that I'm doing today when I was a kid. But I was lucky enough to be um, a natural musician. In other words, you didn't have to talk me into it. <laughs> it's, what, it's what I wanted to escape to when life got rough. So that part was real easy. Um, activism was not a thing when I was growing up, that's for sure. Um, but I had lived in a home and in a community um, where uh, Indigenous people were not, um, we just never even crossed this screen. <laughs> there wasn't an Indigenous presence. And um, so I had two things happen to me very early in life. And it's only recently, kind of while we were making that documentary, that it occurred to me. I had two things happen to me that should have ruined me. <laughs> One, I was told I couldn't be a musician. And the other, I was told I couldn't be Indigenous. I was told I couldn't be a musician because I would fail in music classes where the job was not to make music, but the job was to decode European notation. And it uses the other side of the brain to do that. I'm not very good at it. And, it. and when I was halfway through my life, I finally found out I'm actually dyslexic in music. So I was told something by authority figures, by grownups. I was told that I couldn't be a musician. So what that did to my little head was, well, sometimes grownups are wrong, I guess. <laughs> and the same thing, you can't possibly be Indigenous because there aren't any more Indians around here. They're all gone. There's a few out in Arizona, maybe. So uh, that uh, view so young in my life almost gave me a loophole, a permission of, well, what about this? When I would run into stuff that just plain didn't make sense and shouldn't have made sense. So in a way, I think that my indigeneity and my uh, sense of music and art, I, I think they're somehow connected, at least in my heart they are, and it's probably the same side of the brain too. So activism was really just sticking up for a reality that I knew about that others didn't know about, and therefore it became a gift instead of a weapon. Mm -hmm. And many of my peers, like in the American Indian movement, those guys had just gotten out of jail. They were trying to um, deal with uh, life in the streets and helping Indigenous people realize that they didn't have to get arrested just for being Indian in <laughs> Milwaukee, St. Paul. Yeah. So they were coming from this kind of thing, and I was coming from a different experience. So my activism tied more into being a teacher 
but I mean like a little kid's teacher, <laughs> not a college <laughs> teacher, not a high school teacher, but a little kid's teacher. So I've managed to keep that sense of, you know what? They just don't know yet. And that really has kind of been my ace in the hole. Uh, and when things have been terrible for me, I've always known that they're just not ripe yet. So that's kind of, it's, it's all together for me. Creativity, the creator, <laughs> being Cree, kind of. I mean, for me, I've, I've learned how to live with a lot of uncertainty. And I think probably that is the, the place in today's Indigenous community where where I'm kind of the center of things in my own heart in that all of us are somewhat uncertain of this, that, or the other thing. And that is what truth and reconciliation is about. We have been sold a bill of goods. And you know what? It was always baloney. It always was. They were always wrong about those things. And we don't have to even worry about it. We just have to come up with something better in our own homes, in our own hearts, in our writing, in our teaching, in our learning, in our sharing. And look, here we are. We haven't, Jeanette, you and I haven't seen each other for a hundred years. And That's here we true. are on a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, life stays the same and life changes. And it's so good to see you. Miigwech, miigwech. It's, uh, well, it, it, it's just uh, amazing to me to be able to, uh, like you say, be on a Zoom call with you after uh, all these years and to uh, look back and see all the different uh, accomplishments and uh, I guess the impact you've had on people. That has been so outstanding. And I think like uh, Don said at the beginning, you have been a role model because you've been way up there on the outside dealing with uh, that larger society and uh, telling them the truth. You know, you talked about uh, genocide in your songs and that was amazing. Long before we are talking about it now, but now we've reached that stage where we can feel uh, that we can talk about these uh, aspects of what we've been living with. And uh, I'm just so pleased that uh, we've had the opportunity to connect. And uh, I believe there's a photo here somewhere. Did, did you get to see it or are we going to show it to the people on the webinar? Because that's important to uh, discuss that was uh, that photo was from 1966 uh-huh and uh i don't see it on the screen but anyways maybe it's out there somewhere but it's you uh singing you came to our community in wequemicon at that time we called it wequemicon wequem wequemicon unceded reserve and now we've changed. We're getting a little more uh, knowledgeable, I guess. We're, we are the Wequemkong unceded territory because we're understanding and we're taking those steps to uh, act like a nation. We have our sovereign rights, and that's what we are doing out there, just little by little. Uh, we are saying this is who we are. This is our land, and uh, and this is uh, our history. We have our language and our uh, responsibility to each other uh, within our clan systems and within our teachings. And this is what's happening right now. So, but I just wanted to say you were part of that uh, Activism, I guess, is the best word to say in the 1960s, the middle 1960s, when uh, women from my community, uh, Wequemicon, and that was Rosemary Fisher and uh, Yvonne McCray, Jean Shauna, even my auntie, Helena Trillo, who was always so shy, but she was right there. And they went out uh, to Saskatchewan I think that's where they found your people. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, we want to uh, 
do for our ancestors, that we want to have a social gathering, we want to meet each other, and we want to do it our way, not, you know, with someone else coming and staging it. So that's when we had our first powwow. That was in 1966. And you were invited by, I, I believe it was Wilfred Pelche and Yvonne. They found you somewhere. Elenisa Bomswin was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were all collectively really, really strong in showing not only to uh, each other, but to the rest of the world that Oh, there it is. See, there you are in the old arena that uh, we are so proud of who we are as a people. And you came there and I believe you were just starting out with your singing uh, career, I guess I would say singing, but your, uh, I guess the, the recognition and those songs you created, your artistic ability and your musical ability. And, you know, we, we were just so impressed at that time that uh, you were there and you were just starting out. Oh. And we continued. So there you are, Buffy. And uh, oh, thank you. I can oh, remember. How sweet is that? And and you know, Rose, Rosemary and Yvonne dressed me too, because I didn't have a traditional dress, but they dressed me, you know, they gave me my uh, you know beaded windband and yeah. a feather to wear and dressed me like sisters, you know, and that was so meaningful to me. And, and if you look at that picture, you look kind of where my belt is. <laughs> you can see there well, are singers and drummers in the background. And yeah. that's my dad, that's Emil Pipot. Yeah. I know from his, from that black outfit and the beaded shoulder pieces that he would wear. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah. sweet of you to show me that picture. <laughs> Well, I'm just glad I found it because uh, it, it just fits in with uh, when we're talking about how did you get into all this? Like, uh, I never left the reserve until I was in my mid-teens. And then I went to Toronto and got involved in all this other stuff that was happening. But uh, it, it's been a challenge and it's been exciting and it has been uh I think uh, I have that sense of uh, I've done what I was supposed to do. And now I'm leaving it to the younger generation, to my daughter and my sons, that uh, it's their responsibility now to continue what we started in the 60s. And that's to let the rest of the world know. We talk about reconciliation, but we need to, within ourselves, all of us as uh, Nishnabe people, indigenous people, support each other, work together. We can do so much, I believe. Oh, and this year is uh, at that first powwow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's sort of funny to look back, but gosh, I can't believe how long ago that was. But nonetheless, we're still here. That was uh, my friend Phyllis Kenoshmeg, myself, and then uh, I think that's Andrea Williams who. We were uh, working at with the, uh, no, it wasn't then. Later on, we worked with the Anishinaabe Institute, yeah. You know, you mentioned Wilfred Peltier and uh, Rosemary Fisher. Um, and about, I think probably they, they probably, we probably met at the um, the Native Friendship Center on Spadina. I think that's probably, it may have been there, you know. Uh, you know, you look back on something like that and these moments in your life that turn out to be so important. You don't know at the moment how, how important they're going to be and that they'll wind up being your lifetime memories. That's so, right. That's right. Yeah. But, you know, it's very really interesting because you and I starting out from the point from, you know, talking about, well, I guess around 1966, we've yeah. gone, we have not traveled the same route, but it's as though we both had the same Google map, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and also, the other person that I think of so fondly is Delia Opikaku. Um, That's you know, right. Delia yeah. too, you know, I remember there was a story done in the newspaper one time about how Delia, who's a she's a lawyer, she went from um, um, uh, I think they said the Stone Age to the Space Age, something something typical newspaper like that. 
but from Canoe Lake, Saskatchewan, you know, she wound up doing um, uh, treaty law at the Cadillac Fairview, Fairview Tower in Toronto, which sounded yeah. very deadline yeah. at the time. And she has continued. Many of us have continued from where we were at in those days. We've continued as women, just one step at a time, ripening one moment at a time, getting better at this, having to learn that, oh, it's going to be a pain in the neck. Yeah. Oh, it's a Zoom call. Oh, I won't be able to get on. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, it makes me think that, you know, in these days, a lot of people are stressed out about the world, no matter who you are and where you live. But when you figure, you know, there are more people than ever in the history of anywhere uh, right now who all of a sudden have a platform. All of a sudden they can be on little TV yeah. and they're not prepared for that. They're not. It, all of a sudden it was there. Right. So all yeah. of a sudden you have everybody in the world going blah, 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 blah. And very <laughs> often they haven't thought things out. This is the first time that we're all like children. We cannot get frustrated with what we're going through right now. These are great changes. We've yeah. experienced great changes before. Certainly Indigenous people have and, and Indigenous women. I mean, it's like every day you have to get something new. So don't let it frustrate you. It's not just the, yeah. the world it, right now. Uh, every, everybody's in a position suddenly to contribute, whether they have something or not. <laughs> but we can't get frustrated that we hear a, a, a baby going, wow. And a two-year-old going blah, 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 and a and a and a, a five-year-old saying no, nah, yeah, man, nah, well, because mm -hmm. you know why, uh, the European thing, the invasion of the indigenous world. Look when it was done. It, when was it done in history? Who was controlling Europe? It was the worst time in human history for Europeans to run around interacting with anyone else. On the thrones of Europe, Ferdinand and Isabella were running the Inquisition, which had been torturing white people for thousands of years, and nobody ever says it. That's white right. people were going through the pecking order long before they even knew about us. Yeah. Why yeah. it was so sick, you know? On the thrones, who was on the throne in, in, uh, in England? Henry VII and Henry VIII. And they killed more than a few wives. I mean, tens of thousands of people. They killed them because they could. So yeah. they didn't have a sense of government. All they had was this stupid pecking order where the guy with the biggest fist and the most weapons terrorizes everyone else. It's what we have today, but it's not all that's yeah. available. And indigenous people have had other forms of government that most people don't know about. So don't get mad at people for not knowing. See, that's why I say I'm a teacher, but I'm not like a high school teacher. I'm not challenging anybody. I'm like a first grade teacher. You know what? I've had privilege of airplane tickets and um, interaction with indigenous people and non-indigenous people all over the place, you know, a, a lot more than any of my peers at the time. So if I was ahead, that doesn't make me better or something. It just means that there's a world out there that exists and we find out about it. Some of us find out from someone like Jeanette. Somebody else mm -hmm. finds out from somebody like um, Dennis Banks. Somebody else finds out from somebody like Alan East or yeah. from me. So we're all coming from a very precious individual uniqueness, I think, each one of us. And each one of us is ripening all the time, even the people we don't like. <laughs> yes, I think, I really do think. Yeah. So although it's very discouraging to be, um, you know, having been invaded, when we look at the time that we were invaded, I mean, you had Ferdinand and Isabella, you had Henry VIII, and who was on the throne of Eastern Europe at the time of Columbus? Who? Nobody ever tells you this in history, women's history, anybody's yeah. history. Vlad the Impaler, that is freaking <laughs> Cuba. That's what happened to us. Yeah. We, we weren't defeated in fair fights because of superior weaponry and uh, clever thinking and um, uh, Greek science or um, British legal system. No, no. What happened to us was the Inquisition, Henry VIII, Vlad the Impaler. It happened to Europe first, and it really hurt a lot of people. Yeah. It's a piece of the puzzle that's it's not talked about very often. Mm -hmm. And if we can see, I mean, we have been taught that we were overwhelmed by fair fights, majority odds, and superior weaponry and intelligence. That's not what happened. Uh -uh. I, yeah, you're right. I So when we 
I, yeah. I'm just saying I'm getting lots of messages here from yeah. everybody who wants to know that, you know, for Buffy and Jeanette, you're both phenomenal educators, Buffy, with your cradle board teaching project. And, you know, this isn't the first time you were a trailblazer. Um, I mean, I still remember when you were on Sesame Street, mm -hmm. in fact, you know, talking, talking to all of us as we were having our grilled cheese sandwiches in the mornings. <laughs> And so if and, you and could tell us board, yeah. Yeah, a little bit about that time and what your thoughts are on the, the role of education in this fight for survival, for the survival of our, our languages and our cultures and our people, um, and, and Jeanette as well will ask, you know, especially right now, given this, this, our awareness through shining the light on the incredibly dark relationship that Indigenous people in Turtle Island have had with schooling, you know, with their residential schools. But how do we see, how do you see the role of education for our young people moving forward in our in our struggles? Oh, are you asking me? Oh, sure, we'll start with you and then Jeanette. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I well, I agree with Maurice Sinclair and um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, in that ed education is the thing. Also, I had the opportunity to do a Zoom call with the Dalai Lama. Oh my. <laughs> no, I asked him about misogyny and I asked him about indigenous, uh, you know, uh, what's happened to us. He, uh, the Dalai Lama, I was told by his staff, is not really, uh, they're aware of Amazon indigenous people, but he did not really have an awareness of North American indigenous people. I was very surprised <laughs> to find out. Um, but in talking with the Dalai Lama and asking him about misogyny and the treatment of Indigenous people, his answers, uh, you know, it's always uh, mindfulness, in other words, find out, and compassion, and putting those together, education. So I agree with Maury and with many other thinkers that it, it's kind of where I come from, too. Like I'm going to go back to being a first grade teacher again, you know, and not blaming people for not knowing if you're going to take the time to blame people for not knowing, you're always going to be in a fight. No, just give them the answers. <laughs> Don't make them take the test, just give them the answers. Yeah. We're trying to educate people here. And um, you mentioned the Cradle Board Teaching Project, you know, um, <laughs> kind of like you, Jeanette. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to be retired, but I'm not there yet. And so with the Cradle Board <laughs> Teaching Project, which I started at the end of Sesame Street, when my son, my we had to decide whether to continue Sesame Street or live where he, you know, in Hawaii where we had been living. And my son very much wanted to live in Hawaii. So when he was in grade five, his teacher came to me and she was required by law to teach an Indian unit. And of course, it was all just baloney. It was so shallow. It was about no one. And it was all in the past, and it was just silly. So I started writing um, something. I started writing curriculum. Um, and eventually, my Nihiwan Foundation went from just giving scholarships to building a whole curriculum program, partnering program. But, and now what we're doing is, I have a wonderful team. Oh, and we're trying to bring Cradle Board to Canada in the right way. And um, it's very, very exciting. But like you, Jeanette, the way I put it, I'm not trying to be the mother this time. I'm too busy. There's too much yeah. to do. The project is too huge. And so I'm trying to be the grandmother and we have a wonderful board. And I'm also working with the Downey Wenjack Fund. Uh, I'm on their board. So in education, the, the big standout is how many qualified people we have in every part of education. I mean, mm -hmm. teacher training, um, and, you know, people are on boards and learning how to be principals and getting PhDs in education. And, I, and I'm talking about Indigenous people, many Indigenous yeah. being women as well. So what I'm seeing is that um, when I first started the Cradle Boy Teaching Project, nobody had computers. This was in the late 80s. And nobody had computers. And teachers were not about, no, you go to a tenured professor and talk about, they're going to have to learn how to use a computer. Uh-uh, it did not fly. <laughs> So it was too early. Also, it, when I started the Cradle Board Teaching Project in the US, we were required by our funders to serve American children first, which we did, but we also had a whole lot of Canadian content because it's appropriate. 
So um, at the border. For, for education, I think that the main thing that's the main thing wrong with education is it's boring. How can learning be boring? I mean, for me, learning is almost like free money. Thank you very much. I mean, um, so I, I feel as a multimedia person that education does not have to be boring. It should never be boring. So um, we could spend a whole lot of time just talking about Cradle Board, and I don't want to take all, all the time for that. We would do that at another time unless somebody yeah. wants to well, to, just to uh, carry on from what you're saying, uh, now we've got uh, that understanding that our civilization as people on Turtle Island in North America and in South America is thousands of years old, a hundred thousands. And one of our archaeologists has uh, come out and said that, much to the consternation of other archaeologists, but We've always talked about that. We've been here from time immemorial, our elders have always said, and they're finding evidence now. So with that, we have that history and we're looking at our communities, our young people, how did we learn? And where did we learn? And how did we convey it? That's all coming out now. And the term that's being used is land-based teaching. And it's spreading right across Canada now. And, and, and it takes that boring aspect out of learning within the schools. Our young people now in schools where they have land-based teaching, they're out there with nature. They're learning about the plants. They're learning about the fish, about the birds, how everything interacts. And also about the gifts that we've been given, like the water and the... Uh, the land that we need to survive and where our place is on that hierarchy. All the animals and all the parts of nature, and we know that it's all living. It it's, uh, has that essence of spirit in everything. And this is what we're trying to share with everybody so they don't continue to pollute our environment. But I mean, that that's a separate challenge. But I guess what I want to say is that the language we're wanting to ensure that it comes back because that's unique to us and our culture, all those other teachings that uh, are part of who we are and that's coming back. And this is the gifts that we will be giving our young people and they will carry it on. And, uh, and our people who are already in the education field I think that they understand, they realize. I was talking to Delia Opikaki, our friend, and she was telling me about the curriculum and saying, you know, who's out there, you know, who can work on curriculum that uh, is good for us, but it's also will be usable for the rest of uh, the people who are living here. And, and we can do all that. And we will ensure that our our children, our young people, and our parents have that knowledge, and we can do all those accomplishments like in science and technology and industry. That's all available. We can pick that up. But and to you know, know who just, we are, that's important. We, we can we can we can grab onto that positivity of. I mean, you know, I remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she was sticking out for women. She said, "If we only get your foot off our neck, you know, and and just to get the whole weight of history, um, you know, just the whole misinterpretation where you know you guys are nothing and we're everything, you know, just to mm. get that gone is is very important, I think. And I get a couple of things that I tell you about. One, I'm always grumbling about land acknowledgements. And when I was going to open the Junos one year, they wanted me to do the land acknowledgement and they handed me a piece of paper to read, right? And it's talking about these unceded lands and millennia. And I'm like, oh, which lawyer wrote this? <laughs> so I I got in touch with, with, um, with um, the local indigenous people and, and told them what I wanted to do. In the first place, the word unseeded is very lawyerly. I mean, yeah. children in grade six don't know what that means. And, and what it does is it makes you hesitate for a second. You hear that word and you say unseeded. Does that mean he yeah. doesn't have a seat? Does that mean he's a tennis player and he's not? Um, he's an unseeded player? 
but it makes you hesitate long enough so that you miss the point. Yeah. Unceded territory. So I changed that. And I said, unsurrendered territory. It's a much more powerful. Actually, if, I like that word better than unceded. Yeah. And then we got to the part about who oh, have for millennia. And I, that politician is talking. I will not say that millennia. I will not. And so I changed it and I said for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I mean, I was going to go on and on and put 10 or 12, but <laughs> I don't agree. But I really suggest to people that they take that land acknowledgement and put it into real people language uh, wherever they happen to live. If you're, with, if you're in parliament and you want to say unseated in millennia, go ahead. But if you're talking to real people, heaven's sakes, it's, it's important. Use language that people understand and don't try to trip them on the way to understanding. That is terrible. That's manipulation. And it's it's just, it's something that needs to be changed. It's an old colonial residue. And I think it's a little bit deliberate. So sorry, I brought it up, but now you got to do something. <laughs> Oh well, no, that's what... I love it. I love the <laughs> idea of unsurrendered territory. I think we're yeah. going to start a movement here to change all the land acknowledgements and you know, maybe get some t-shirts for everybody. That'll be our, our next plan. Um, so we want to take a moment. Uh, there was a question in the chat, you know, to acknowledge that because of you, Jeanette Corbier Laval, that because you spent 50 years fighting against the government of Canada to remove the sex discrimination in the Indian Act. And because of you, literally hundreds of thousands of our children and grandchildren are now able to apply to return to our communities, uh, to back where we belong. And this is an amazingly powerful thing. Can you tell us so about some of your work as uh, now you're the citizenship commissioner for the Anishinaabek Nation to honor that rule uh, that you've had, you know, essentially as the, the grandmother of our nations, bringing back all of our people, all of our children and grandchildren. Well, when I think back, I remember um, many years ago in Toronto, we had the Toronto Indian Club and uh, the chief there at, at the time, his name was Chief Jasper Hill. And at an event, he uh, called me up because uh, there was a bunch of us as young women there. And he gave me a name, Nishnabe name. Well, he said it in English, but I say it in Nishnabe now. And it was North Star. He said, you are Princess North Star. And he gave it to me and he said, you will carry this and you will find what you're going to do with it. And uh, over the years, I, I didn't really think about it, but when you think of the North Star, right, it's the one star that's stationary and it'll take you home. It'll find your home by that star. And home is where we belong. And as the Commissioner on Citizenship, our uh, code for uh, citizenship is we say, Ed Ben Dogsijik, Ed Ben Dogsijik Nok the those who belong, the law for those who belong. And that's really important because we know our people and we know where we came from and we know where we belong. So that is our uh, code right now. And we want to share that with the rest of our people just so we don't have to deal with the Indian Act. And that's the government that was designed specifically to get rid of us. And we all know that history with the uh, Duncan Campbell Scott, who says, uh, fewer Indians, the better. Well, sorry, but we are not going to go that route. We have so many of our people out there, and we need to recognize each other, support each other, bring our people back to their homes where they belong, at the Bendogsijik, or the Bendogos, I belong, and uh, strengthen our nations if we want to be recognized as a, a strong Anishinaabe nation then we have to act like a nation we have land and we have citizens at the Bendogsuje and we have our language Anishinaabe Mwen and then we have our culture Anishinaabe Adzuen and that's a way of living we have our history and our spirituality that's 
part of the criteria of nationhood. And this is what we're working on right now. And I hear young people like on the radio, CBC or wherever, they're strong and they're talking like this and saying, you know, no more of that old Indian Act uh, BS. We want to take all that out of those Indian Act laws. Taken a while, it takes us so long. It took us 50 years just for me to get my uh, sense of belonging back to my community. And now my children, thank goodness, are all part of that and grandchildren because we're all part of that nation. And no one has the right to say, no, you don't belong. And it's ongoing, but but it has made a big impact. And I think for some of our people, it's made all the difference in the, you know, the willingness to keep on living because we're dealing with so many barriers. We have racism, we have exclusion, we have... Uh, Oh, just so many barriers, but we just have to find a way to get around all that. And we can do it in ourselves as a strong nation of people. And, and that's why I keep going every day, even though, like Buffy said, we should be retired. <laughs> I turned 80 last summer and it seems I'm busier than ever, you know, but but that's good. As long as I keep, I can move. And I see all my friends out there, you know, like you and Delia and... Uh, and Alanise out in Montreal, it, it, we're all still doing our thing. So, thank goodness. You, you, yeah. know, you mentioned history, and um, I'm young people, uh, you know, little kids, but all of us really, the child in all of us is just being hurt every day. Every day it's something else, you know, residential schools and, and graveyards and missing and murdered. I mean, there's so much bad news. So. Yeah. What I'm trying to do for my little piece and working with, um, uh, you know, Downey Wenjack Fund, who are wonderful, uh, I I worked with them and we came up with these two little videos you ought to look up. They're only like a minute or a minute and a half long, they're real short. The first one is, is my desire to have, I mean, during hockey season, baseball season, basketball season, football season, shinny, soccer, whatever, sports season. Wouldn't it be nice if some kid sitting in the backseat of a car could let his friends know, you know, who is it who invented team sports? Team sports. They were invented on this side of the water. Even the Greek Olympics did not have team sports. They were all individual sports. And who knows that? Nobody knows that. So yeah. you figure some nine-year-old boy in the backseat, you know, he starts telling, yeah, you know what? Um, uh, on this side of the water, and not only the rubber ball. I mean, indigenous people invented rubber. The Spaniards, of course, they thought, oh, it's the devil, you know, because they didn't. <laughs> so anyway, the rubber ball, also the stadium. Did you know that? With bleachers on either side and goalposts, opposing goalposts and protective equipment like shoulder pads and knee pads, hip pads and helmets with animal logos. It's all it's all indigenous from the Americas and it's all over the world. It's one of the greatest gifts that anybody has for bringing people together, for competing without killing each other too often. Um, and, and, and just for, um, it, it's just such a wonderful thing to, for a kid to know, but they don't know it. That's Another true. thing, how well, long did you guys know that there was a guy named, this is around 1801, a guy named Peter Fiddler, who was a, a surveyor for the Hudson's Bay Company. Canada had only been mapped up to, up to Hudson Bay. And then this surveyor, Peter Fiddler, ran into a Blackfoot man whose name was Akutko Mikiman. Um, and he showed him, he drew a map of 200,000 square miles of the rest of Canada showing the rivers, the mountains, and which people lived where, who got along with whom, who were trading. So this is a tremendously valuable piece of intellectual property. Peter Fiddler brought it to Queen Charlotte of England, who was very grateful. And that was the first map of the rest of Canada. But teachers in Canada don't know that. So That's how can they tell the kids? Teachers in Canada are not aware of team sports being invented on this side of the water. So how can they give that gift to kids? So what I'm saying is that 
when you're talking to your friends, your teachers, your relatives, or your kids, get everybody to find out. You know, everybody go a little, you know, you can make you could make up games, you could scavenger hunts, you could do anything. But all these little pieces of history, they're found on this reserve and that reserve and this person's stories and that one's memories. It's so exciting. So when we think of um, reinvigorating, rescuing um, um, indigenous history, don't look at it as a chore. We don't have to tear mm -hmm. anything down. You don't have to tear down the school system. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is keep keep on ripening, keep on keep on turning it to Jeanette. Yeah. <laughs> don't she give up. Tough. Don't burn out. We can do our own books, write our own books for our children too. Yes, but we but, have to do the research. Yeah, exactly. yeah. We have to ask each other and we have to listen to each other and turn each other's stuff into better and better. Yeah, yeah. And keep telling those stories as we know yeah. that, you know, Buffy and Jeanette, Buffy, you've used your voice and the power of song to provoke, to bring joy. I'm remembering, you know, the Universal Soldier was a huge hit or yeah. Up Where We Belong. I'm sure most people don't even remember that, that those were your, your words. Yeah. Became made you the first Indigenous person to win an Academy Award, um, and my personal favorite has always been you know, "Darling, Don't Cry." When you say the part about I met him on the Powwow Trail, I'm pretty sure a whole lot of us are remembering someone special from our summers at the Powwow Trail when we were young. Every time I hear that, um, so these songs had a huge impact on multiple generations. Make us all cry here. <laughs> it does. I know. I was just thinking that. <laughs> but it's it's beautiful and for all of the young people and and all of us who are not so young but are still following in your footsteps yeah. what would you share with the young people now those of us who are starting on our journey those of us who are trying to to pick up the mantle and and to carry on the amazing work that you all have started what is your advice you know when we face challenges or racism or you know inevitably that person who tells us we're not good enough what what advice do you give you just have to keep your nose on the joy trail you <laughs> just have to seek it out or you will not find it because life is too busy too serious your teachers you know your college professors and your bosses they all have agendas to take up all of your time and everybody has forgotten about play and joy so my advice is don't burn out and only do the hard things. It's very important to accomplish the hard things. Yes, it is. And we've all stayed up too late trying to finish something. How many times, right? But mm -hmm. what's going to make you survive is, is uh, an, an, an internal nutrition. <laughs> and you get that from other people. And you get that from solitude. You get that from interacting with people. And you get that from holding back when you know it's time for you to hold back. Uh, for women, my best advice is don't forget two of the best things in the world is take a bath and have a nap. <laughs> but nobody tells you that. Yeah. Right. So we kind of treat ourselves as um, intellectual workhorses too. And if you, you it, by keep your nose on the joy trail, I mean, like there's something that I said in that documentary that makes sense in the same way. It says, some will tell you, some will tell you what you really want ain't on the menu. Don't believe them. Cook it up yourself and then prepare to serve them. You know, it's as if they don't believe in chocolate cake. <laughs> it up yourself and then prepare. That's how you teach people. That's how you make change. Not by hitting them over the head. <laughs> Maybe yeah. somebody does it that way, but that's not the way. It's not the only way to do it. There are other ways to do it. You can do it through, you know, education, through intellectual things, through law, through making changes like you have done, Jeanette. Oh my. God. Uh -huh. Just I want to add my my thanks and my aloha and my <laughs> <laughs> and my to you for what you've personally done for so many people. I mean, you really are uh, has anybody made a statue of you yet? <laughs> I don't think I want that. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> I know. But uh, you're our, absolutely right. Uh, uh, I think when I look at my grandchildren and other students around the community and young people, 
Uh, all I would like to tell them is to enjoy each day. And this is what our elders are telling us. Find something to be feel good about, to have that sense of humor, to laugh about. And, and we should all be enjoying each day. Don't let all that other stuff get us down. And uh, because we, we will be successful, we will achieve what we want. And the resources are out there. Uh, I'm seeing so many young people now who have been through the system. They've got, they're professional, they're educated, but they're really down to earth. When they come home, they see their relatives, they're right in there. Like you said, they're cooking and sharing and uh, laughing, going in the bush and picking berries and learning medicines. That's all important. And that's what will make you feel good. I wish I had done more of that. I mean, I did do a lot of it, but it could have been more. <laughs> I don't think anybody could have done more. I can't tell you the number of times that we've been walking down the street and some young man will come running up and want to give you a hug because he remembers that you were his teacher, you know, somewhere way back and that you believe to them and, you know, they're off doing some amazing, wonderful things or, you know, some young woman who remembers that you inspired them, both of you. So this, you both have done so much. And I, I really want to say that I think I have heard loud and clear the message about the importance of positivity. I remember being in, I think we were in Manhattan, we were down there at the UN and I had my daughters with me and my mom, we had gone to the UN and, you know, as part of our, our traditional way of learning, of teaching our young people, those are, are, I brought my daughters so that they could participate, so that they could see, so that they could be part of going to the UN and speaking to our people and experience. And they went with grandma, toured all over Manhattan, and they had walked miles and miles by this point. And my youngest was just little at that point. And she says, Grandma, I'm tired and my feet hurt. <laughs> and her grandma, my mom, Jeanette, looks at her and says, Brianna, you need to be more positive. Think positively. And Brianna looks up and says, Grandma, I'm positive. I'm tired and my feet hurt. <laughs> so they have definitely taken yeah. it to heart. Yeah. And for everybody out there, when things do get tough, yeah. and it is sometimes hard when we feel like we're not making a difference in the chat, people are talking about, you know, the stigma the, the Bill C-31 people that were not accepted back, yeah. but just for everybody to work on raising each other up, on lifting each other up, on yeah. welcoming all of our brothers and yeah. sisters, children and grandchildren, helping those who haven't had a chance to connect, you know, reaching out and, and helping them learn and really working on, on lifting each other up that, you know, we are all Indigenous enough and we all deserve that opportunity to learn and reconnect just because we haven't had it so far is, is not anybody's fault of our own, at least. So remembering everybody, and hopefully we'll have many more opportunities like this. And I think, you know, if anybody wants to send some word to the powers that be at Trent, I think, you know, Jeanette Corby Laval was already one of our honorary degrees, one of our honorary doctorates. And now as amazing alumni, I think having Buffy St. Marie as an honorary degree and alumni would be an amazing, powerful thing. So yes. we will do our best to put the word out there with the powers that be that make those decisions because you are such a hero. Do you, do you know that for a while I was an adjunct professor at Trent? Oh, That's, really? I did not know that. No, it, but it was fun. <laughs> Nobody knew uh -huh. what computers were in those days and we tried to figure it out together. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe we can get you back for a class or two yeah. sometime soon. Well, it would be amazing. So I wish we had more time. I, um, I I can't tell you how honored I am to have been part of this. Um, and hopefully this is just the first of many, many more conversations. So sadly, our time is up. And I want to thank everybody who attended in the Women's History Project. Our next session will be in the fall. Our virtual event is going to focus on the historical aspects of women in the economy. And I want to thank you, Buffy St. Marie, for coming, for being here with us, for sharing your memories, all of your management team, and especially Natasha for helping make this possible and getting everybody here on time and organizing us. Thank you so much to my mom, Jeanette Corby-Laval, for everything you have done for not just me, but 
<laughs> all of our brothers and sisters out there who are, you know, back where we belong because of you. Yeah. And thank you to our sponsors at yeah. CREA, the First People's House here at Trent University, Nancy's very own. These events can't happen without the generosity of our sponsors, partners, and donors. And we've put in the chat how you can donate so that we can have more sessions like this and bring more of our women warriors forward and hear their voices and celebrate their achievements. The information is going to be in the chat. And our sponsors, the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement offers, we do offer tax receipts if you go through to make your donation. Thank you so much, everybody. There is amazing power comes from conversations like these. And there's so many young people, you know, when we look out there that are also doing amazing, wonderful things because trailblazers like you led the way. We're honored so much for you to be here with us. Jimmy Gwetch. Jimmy Gwetch. Jimmy Gwetch. And it's so nice to be on the same panel with Buffy again. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for Thanks, everybody. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you.